welcome everybody to um, DISCA's December uh, 7th regularly scheduled board meeting. Happy holidays to everybody. Uh, for you folks on Zoom, how's the sound tonight? It's actually better than normal. Oh, okay, good. We've, we've turned it up. And um, so for those on Zoom, if you're not speaking, would you please mute? And welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm David Lowe, your uh, president. And tonight, as a holiday edition of our board meeting, we may be a little bit more brief on some topics. So we finish on time and get some refreshments. So uh, starting off, uh, seeing if we have a quorum, and I think we have a full house. Full house. So uh, everybody welcome and thanks for coming. Um, uh, secretary's report, uh, the minutes, uh, again, Judy, thank you for Yeoman's work on that. I realize having yes. done it uh, partially with, um, with uh, what a job it is and how much we appreciate that. Well, thank uh, heavens for the YouTube recording. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it work. And uh, it was circulated to the board members a day or two ago. Are there comments, corrections? That uh, is our motion to adopt. Kathy, thank you. And all, uh, everybody okay? Kathy, right. move just for a second. Patrick, yeah. Oh, and, uh, yeah. 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 Um, Clark, treasurer's report, what do you have for us, sir? Um, we actually have five thousand nine hundred ninety-three dollars and ten cents for the checking account, and that's before the refreshments. <laughs> and that's, that's before the refreshments. Try to put out John's card oh, yeah. so that we'll use it as yeah, a tour. Tour is very good. Um, okay. uh, would very you please, John? Good. I think maybe that's you. Would you please mute, uh, sir? Hello? Mute, please. Uh, that, thank you. Okay, um, moving on to our new business, I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Debbie Trice. Debbie and I met in uh, Rosemary District Association um, Lights. So we both lived in Cityside for a period of time. I've gotten to know Debbie both as the RDA and her as a candidate. Um, a, a delightful, bright, uh, thoughtful person, and that's why I personally supported her in the campaign and delighted to see her elected as a commissioner. Um, she and I talked earlier today, and I think something a little bit different than with our former guest speakers, she suggested because she's relatively new, that she'll keep her remarks quite brief and leaving that much more time for discussion with her. So, um, Debbie, I think some of you will have seen her bio from when she was campaigning, she might talk just a second or two about uh, her, some of her, um, her her background and so forth. But we're delighted to have you and uh, have a seat. Oh, thank oh. you, thank you. I was anticipating I was going to have to stand, which in a sense is a little bit difficult um, because I am really still in listening and learning mode. I. You want me over there? Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've been in office now for three weeks. Uh, have not had an opportunity to take the mandatory briefing on Sunshine Law. So <laughs> I'm reluctant to say too much about things that are coming before the commission. Um, so, uh, but I do want to hear from you. I really appreciate being invited tonight. Uh, one of my concerns as I was running is there are so many neighborhoods or, and, and in general in the city that people have partial information or the city has not been as forthcoming as we would wish and people are jumping to conclusions which sometimes turn out to be wrong or we have conspiracy theories. 
And I myself am learning, oh, gee, I was wrong when I thought this was why we were doing thus and so. So um, I want to make sure that I have plenty of chances to find out what your concerns are, being able to clear up things <coughs> where you wonder and if I happen to have an answer. So that I hope to come by and participate many times. Please invite me, please uh, uh, contact me. And one of the things, again, that I learned over the last couple of months, frequently uh, we wait and make public comment at commission meetings when an item is on the agenda. But what you have seen for the last two commission meetings, and Victor McTeer was actually there, if you come at the very beginning of a meeting, you can make a comment on something that's not on the agenda. And that gives you an opportunity to plant a seed in the minds of the commission members maybe we need to put that topic on the agenda at a future meeting. And if you miss the 9 a.m., you can come at the end of the meeting and you have seen that happen at the last two meetings. So I will encourage you when there's something on your mind to come to the 9 a.m. portion of the meeting and express your concern and get the commission thinking about the issue. Um, so as far as some of the hot issues, they keep changing. <laughs> uh, my hot button is still going to be housing for low and moderate income working families and longtime retirees because they really are being pushed out of our <coughs> housing market. Um, obviously, the future of the Van Wezel and the issue of the proposed Sarasota Performing Arts Center, and I keep those two separate. I don't think at this point it's an either or. So I want to learn more about both of the possibilities and figure out what ultimately is a good long range solution for all of Sarasota. Um, talking about information and transparency, I want to encourage the city not only to be more transparent and be more open, also to provide that information in a, a fashion that we can understand. And I don't know if you saw Monday's uh, commission meeting went with the discussion of the missing middle housing. The initial descriptions were text defining what it was and how much you could build. And I said, would you please put that in plain language and say in a typical uh, parcel in that neighborhood, uh, you could you could currently build one unit, and if this passes, you can build four units. And if you do that, one of those four units has to be for uh, low or moderate income, well, low income below 80%. So I said, give us some real numbers that we can relate to rather than you know this text definition. So I'm going to encourage more of that to happen. Uh, and the reason I also bring that up is an issue that the commission has gotten over 100 emails within the last three days has been what is called parklet outdoor dining. And a lot of this total misunderstanding of what that is, um, it, it's not the end of outdoor dining. The intention was during the pandemic when there was very little business in downtown and parking was not in great demand, the city said, hey, as an emergency basis, we will allow restaurants to take 
parking spaces from Main Street that are in front of their um, restaurants and convert them temporarily to dining. Now that the economy has returned back to normal and a lot of people are coming downtown to say, where can I park? Um, it's no longer in the public interest to assign those parking spaces to an individual restaurant. So that provision was going to be sunsetted on December 31st, but it was not going to be the end of outdoor dining. It was going to return parking spaces to the public. Um, and the name Parklet, my first reaction is, oh, are you talking about the use of parking spaces? And I was reminded that other cities, they use the term Parklet as a mini public park. So even if we're talking mini public park, right now the provisions are enabling a single restaurant to take over that mini public park rather than make it open to the public. So right now um, we're looking, well, uh, the city attorney, Bob Fournier, is looking at how other cities have handled it because of the you know, public uh, benefit issue of the use of streets um, and what we might do. And in order for him to have enough time to make that assessment and make some recommendations, um, the outdoor dining in the public parking spaces has been extended to the end of March. However, they will no longer be free. The restaurant owners will be charged for the use of those parking spaces. But again, it's extended to the end of March, at which time we hope to have another alternative. I suggested that some of the restaurants might want to negotiate with their neighbors to use some of their sidewalk space. Or if the neighbor is another restaurant, maybe hop over and you know, negotiate with a retailer a ways away. Another option is defining the park lets as public parks and let the restaurant owners deliver to any of those little public parks. And Patrick, I see you shaking your head. And after I made that suggestion the other night, I realized the downside, and you can express that concern, the downside is these would be public parks, public. So some of the homeless individuals might decide, hey, this is a great place for me to sit down and enjoy our Sarasota weather. So, you know, there are pluses and minuses. And as the suggestions come through, I anticipate all of you <laughs> will feed your comments into um, city staff, city hall. Uh, and also I would be interested in you uh, expressing your preference for let's go ahead and have dining in parking spaces or no we want parking spaces returned to public use so these are things that obviously um, affect you directly and i hope that within the next month or two you'll express um you know a little bit of your input based on some more information that I hope that I've given you some information you didn't have before. So my thing really, I came here to listen and hear. Um, I <laughs> brought a big notebook with me, so I do want to take notes. So I'm gonna turn it over to both comments and questions. Thank you. Going around the room, who would like to start off, anybody? Bob? Um, if, if I, yeah, but uh, we happened to be downtown last night, and of course there was nowhere to park on the streets, but we have parking garages. 
So it was very simple to, to drive, you know, a block and a half, park in the parking garage. Fortunately, the elevators weren't working, you know, which is another story. But at the end of the day, there's plenty of places to park. And I don't know, have you heard much from the restaurant owners? Is this something that they want to continue with? Uh, I, I, I know there are people who live in this building that will not uh, eat inside a restaurant. Since COVID, I mean, they just uh, they just won't. And without outdoor dining, uh, you know, that business is, is going to dry up for, for some of those restaurants. Well, I, unfortunately, right now, of all the restaurants downtown, there are only about a dozen that are using this expanded outdoor dining. Yeah. So is it fair if it's just that dozen? And is it fair if other retailers say, hey, my clients want to come and park right in front of me and you know they're not going to carry their parcels to a garage. So, you know. Oh, I know. But I'm, 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 yeah, I'm glad to hear you express your, yeah. Yeah, well, the uh, comment I would make is, is that the major attraction for downtown is dining. Uh, we've got 85 to 90 uh, eating establishments, and uh, uh, that is, it, it, we, whether we like it or not, that it has dominated downtown. Uh, the idea of, and Bob has mentioned it, uh, my wife and I uh, rarely, if ever, eat inside, we prefer outside. I had lunch today downtown uh, at uh, Classic Room, you know, across the street with the cure. And uh, there were uh, 12 people eating inside and 84 outside. Um, there was 24 parking spaces theoretically generate around four million in uh, income for these restaurants. Um, so I think this is, has some complex issues to it that um, and I, I, I go to the back to the parking. Um, we got over a thousand new spaces downtown since I moved here with the Whole Foods, with the Mark, uh, with Palm Avenue, State, State Street. State Street. Um, no, I won't tell the story. Um, a um, store owner said uh, that uh, the customers that they couldn't park in front would drive out to the University Town Center and shop. I wonder where they park. Um, but anyway. Well, let, let me, um, something that I didn't mention, uh, one of the issues is the use of the public parking spaces for private use is illegal. And it was possible during the emergency of the pandemic. So yeah, possibly they could be converted into public park lakes <coughs> for public purpose, but not dedicated to an individual restaurant's use. I'm, I'd like to respond to that recently, and that is, um, when the city remodeled the major quarter Main Street, they put out bump outs mm -hmm. uh, to make it safer <coughs> for pedestrians. And those are part of, that's part of the public space that it was on. And now we have a whole series of restaurants using that public space. And that may not be, that may be part of what would be removed. I don't know. Well, if we were, you're going to ruin the downtown restaurant. Well, but, but I mean, again, it's the issue of public use, mm -hmm. private use of public space. And I mean, I'm going to have to defer to the city right. attorney, but he made it very clear that the use of the pub parking spaces couldn't continue for private use. Well, Wait, okay. yeah, and okay. they also. Oh, well, I think I think oh, yeah. Roger has made a point here, but maybe it wasn't as obvious as it ought to be. And this is an economic development issue, and we are generating far more economic activity, four million dollars a year, from the use of those spaces for dining than we are in terms of revenue for parking. And what is it, forty-three thousand dollars a year for that? So we can deal with it. 
there's always a, where there's a will, there's a way, as my grandmother used to say when I was growing up. There's a way to deal with it. So let's not get hung up on the legalities. And, and, and that's why City Attorney Fournier has the next two plus months to do the research and come up with what would be legal. Um, but again, my early suggestion is go ahead and make them public dining areas and let the restaurants deliver to them. I think that concept is basically like at a mall, you have the food court. You can go to restaurants and get what you want. And there are quite a few times, those who go out on Saturday, mm -hmm. they like the coffee here, but they have lousy pastries and there's <laughs> a block down isn't good at pastry. So where do you, you have to go sit at one? You can't sit at the parks because there's no tables in any park anymore. <laughs> so we do need public spaces. And if there's a way to do it that the parking space usage is public, but if they have a sidewalk permit, they can still restrict that to their diners. Now, if they can still bifurcate that, that would open up the space, but the rest of the still serve or, consideration. Or something that you said, why couldn't we put some more tables back in parks? <laughs> and they did it. Some benches, too. Yeah, yeah another issue for us. Okay, yes. Any, any more, more comments? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Wayne? Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Commissioner. I sat on the Downtown Improvement District Board for the incoming chair in January, and we had a discussion on this, and, and uh, City Attorney Fournier came and addressed us uh, last week, this week, Tuesday morning. And we spoke about this issue and have the opinion letter that he made uh, for us uh, on this exact uh, point. We're very supportive of the many members of the board are supportive of the continuation of outdoor dining. The solution we thought and offered up a discussion on this. First of all, we've been asked for a four hundred thousand dollars contribution from our bid budget, which is taxpayer money, for our self taxing district uh, in the core of downtown for the redesign of Main Street and the parking. So maybe those parking lets, the park lets could be handled through that redesign, which I understand is coming up in, in the CIP plan uh, in the next coming cycle. So that was one piece of the concept. The other one is that if you're going to charge the restaurant owners, the fee was going to be approximately 25 hours a day per parking space for the restaurant owners for the use of that space, uh, of the public space. That money we thought could be collected into a fund and it would provide two golf carts for each garage to run people that may be 90 years old that want to park in the garage or have it put up in the garage and valet them to their, uh, in a golf cart to their particular restaurant or, their, or the shopping desire they need. So they call back that number on the cell phone, they pick it up, take it back to your car. That was one concept that did came up with in a short notice mm. of putting our heads together and how do we solve this thing without taking away the vibrance of, we fought three years to put the street lights up. To get those lights on the trees would take a break. <coughs> He wasn't interested in that for years. He did finally pay $300,000 to put the lights in the trees. So we're very proactive and we try to help you and the other fellow commissioners um, beautify the city. We're all about the infrastructure and all about commerce and the health of our merchants. So it's very important in the health of the downtown. When you go downtown without lights, without restaurants outside, you might as well close up downtown again because that's what it looks like when it's dark. There's nothing out there. So appreciate your help and your willingness to listen and work on this matter. It's of utmost importance for the city residents, I believe, and the restaurants in this arrival. Thank because you. Because they're faced with very high inflation, and people think they're making a fortune on the streets, but they're struggling with staff, struggling with inflation of food costs, and trying to survive in their businesses as well. Thank you. And thank you for those ideas. And if anybody else comes up with some thoughts and suggestions, I did uh, suggest to Jonathan Van Dyke of Duval's that he work with uh, Mr. Fournier to make some suggestions, but again, any ideas are welcome and appreciated. Yeah. yeah one, of the, one of the things that I do understand from the merchants is the, you know, there's a, the hours of operation are so different for each of these. And some of those outdoor dining spaces are kind of vacant um, when store hours are in operation. So they're left on the street, Restaurants aren't open. It kind of is a you know, roadblock to you know parking. Um, I don't know if these, these things can be made a little bit more portable where people would have to take them off the street. Um, I do see some restaurants that do that. 
Um, and then there is parking available. So do you not understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So because at night, these uh, retail spaces aren't open anyway. I and mean, we have rarely do we have retail open in the evening, not like on St. Armand. So this would be more of a, um, maybe it would help both sides, but I think it's, it's redesigning the way that we do the uh, outdoor dining. I, there's got to be some best practices in other communities that makes them make them more collectible. Um, yeah, and elevate it. Yeah, it sounds better. like what you're saying is if for a restaurant that's using space in the parking area, that that be very mobile furniture so that they don't put it out maybe until the evening when the when retailers at five o'clock. Yeah. I mean some some restaurants start serving at four or five. So that they could have a more solid <coughs> stuff sure. on their sidewalk mm -hmm. restaurant, but it's and maybe even you know they could gauge in the middle of the summer when it's raining all week long in the evening they may choose not to put out the out as much outdoor dining if they have you know sure. I do know that there are a couple of restaurants who are open during the day, um, but they're not, I mean, they're not very populated. And maybe they still could do their outdoor dining, just not use the park spaces, because in the evening they do overflow. So there might be some way a work around with that. Just one, uh, in the interest of time, I've yeah. got one last thing that we won't go and be able to go into detail, but one of the things important to uh, DISCA and our members is the zoning text amendments that are going to be coming up and uh, the so-called effort for meaningful uh, community input. Um, I have a meeting tomorrow with Steve Cover and others to discuss <coughs> the process for what meaningful uh, and our, one of our cons potential concerns is what's meaningful to one person is not meaningful uh, we would, we would uh, submit that the comp leading up to the comp plan changes, there wasn't the degree of uh, uh, dialogue and, and quality dialogue that should have existed. So we will be uh, lobbying, if that's the right word, to kind of fix that. You have a, in just a little bit of time. Yeah, well, I'm, no, actually, I'm very glad you brought that up. For city commissioners, who have not been involved with CCNA, they are unaware <coughs> of meaningful, the meaningful public input process and proposal. And I suggested to um, Lou Acosta that somebody meet, come to that 9 a.m. portion <coughs> of the next commission meeting, which won't be until January, to let the commissioners know this is something that is being worked on with CCNA, with city staff, um, and here is our concept, here is what our objective is, so that you can gradually bring the commissioners along to understand what's coming. They have no idea that this is coming. So uh, if you ask them, they'd say, well, uh, the process, development process is either administrative review or it's, you know, uh, planning, public, you know, public uh, meetings. So I see meaningful public input process as being better than either of them and it coming first, but people Commissioners who have not been involved in CCNA have no idea, and you should really tell them about it and, I, and tell the public. And the 9 a.m. slot at commission meetings, I think, would be a good start to start telling and selling. Okay. Uh, and just a final remark on 3D modeling, you know, part and parcel of what... I haven't been, gotten to that okay. point yet. Yeah. Uh, is, is to complement the zoning text things with seeing models of what outcomes could be related to affordable housing or whatever. So uh, I'm, I'm going to have to cut can, it off. Can I just say sure. one thing since we were talking about restaurants? This will be fast. Um, there has been some concern about what do we mean by food? 
when you talk about certain restaurants or bars are able to stay in business if they 51% or whatever of their revenue is from food. What is the definition of food? Because some people think popcorn is sufficient. So I would be very, and I've asked, I'm going to start asking that we define food in, in the uh, ordinances. So if you have suggestions of, you know, a, this business shouldn't be able to do it unless the food includes something that meets some definition. So please provide your input. Thank you. Debbie, thank you very much. Welcome to DISCA. We will uh, likely have you back and expect some cards and letters. Right, from us. So, okay. All right, thank you. Um, moving ahead uh, under uh, new business, this is the time of the agenda where we uh, review and approve uh, new associate members. And Patrick, tonight, do we have the Florida Structural Forensic folks with us? If not, okay. Uh, but we want to make a, a, a I move to approve uh, Florida Structural Forensic as a new silver associate member. Second. Okay, everybody okay with that? Okay, welcome. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I do see Mariah Talaferro on there on the screen. And uh, Mariah uh, was with Premier Sotheby's International Realty, and I believe might be our first realtor uh, associate member, uh, which is a, a new category of partners. And um, may we have a motion, please, to accept? Uh, so Okay, uh, so and Judy is Mariah. Mariah. Yeah, uh, and so Judy, uh, Kathy, yeah. seconded by. Okay, uh, and all in favor? We're 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 good with that. Okay, Mariah, welcome. Would you uh, got about forty-five seconds to a minute to introduce your firm and yourself, if you would, please. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, David Lowe and Patrick Gannon, for inviting Premier Sotheby's to be part of DSCA. Um, I have been attending these meetings on occasion, and it's really a, a wonderful benefit to our community. You all are such bright, collaborative minds, so thank you for all that you do. Um, Premier Sotheby's, for those that might not be aware of the brand, um, the Sotheby's brand associated with the auction house, and um, Premier Sotheby's here in Sarasota. We are the, um, the global leader of luxury real estate. Premier Sotheby's in the downtown office was the first office to be associated with the Premier Sotheby's franchise. And to this day, we are the, um, the most productive office, I'm excited to say. So uh, we are um, delighted to be part of this group. We appreciate all of the wonderful information that you share, and it really benefits the realtor community to be up to date with the changes, whether it's legislative changes with condominiums um, or any other information related to the community. So thank you. All right, thank you, Mariah. Welcome, say hello to Craig. Will do. Um, uh, moving along, uh, our next item, Craig, we're gonna go back to money. And um, with uh, your advanced packet, there's a draft, and let me emphasize that it's a draft at this point, the first uh, shot at our budget for next year. And I was wondering, uh, those of you who might have had a chance to look at it, well, Craig, first of all, any, Clark, Clark, Clark. Clark. <laughs> Craig, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, any, uh, overall comments between you and Patrick on what, what we're looking at? Um, no, only that we found a way to come up with a surplus of $462 on <laughs> um, the projection. But um, no, it's very close to what we had last year with the exception of uh, paying $3,700 to Royal Africa to cover in 2020. <laughs> Three and 24, um, as we had before, this gives us a 15% discount. And Wild Africa has become a critical part of our uh, how we function. 
So uh, that's if anybody's looking at this and sees um, sees that number. But otherwise, do you want me to go through it, or do you just want to? I, were, are there, were there any questions at this point, Patrick? Did you have any, or Jamie, do you have any um, particular comments? Uh, no, just to be asking the board is, are you in favor of uh, conducting the survey as we did two years ago? And helping someone helping to participate? And was the data that was produced in that report that we now have a report of value to anyone's board or any decisions? Would be a question. And should we spend the money and should we go to the effort to do it? How much was it again, Jeffrey? We're putting in there $2,000 okay. with the consultant, but most of the work was, Bob knows, was done on our side. I mean, I did processing it for all the data. We used SurveyMonkey, set it all up. Uh, the consultant really just kind of helped us formulate questions and then uh, contact, and she was really the point of contact for the follow ups with the contest. No, I didn't I believe it was really useful. I got a lot of positive feedback uh, from various people, and we were able to use it here uh, at Broadway Prom. So. Well, in, in my opinion on this is as a, um, particularly with insurance, so much in the forefront now, there may be some opportunities to streamline that questionnaire a little bit. We have a baseline from two years ago. I think it would be a shame to not do it this year, and that it not only is a value to our members, but also it's a kind of recruiting tool, if you will, to get others to uh, come into the polls to some of the newer buildings to show the kind of data that we collect, whether it be this or population work or real estate trends or whatever we do. So I, I for one, certainly think it's worth 2,000 bucks. Yeah, I think other condos might be interesting to understand how you take a 75% increase in your wind insurance and translate that into something less than 20% assessment increase. So those are the challenges that I don't understand people are meeting with, and there may be some data there that could be helpful as it's not going away. It's not a one-time thing. So. Any okay, other so comments, board member Peter? Anybody? Um, no, I, I think I support that. It's a little unusual to put a number in the budget and then have a discussion about what you're going to spend it on. You can work each other way. The board sets a priority as to this is an activity and it's in our goals and its objectives. And then so we put some money against that rather than putting money to push an idea through that the board hasn't discussed really as a priority. Well, that's why it's in there. This is the one opportunity to discuss awesome. priorities. I understand that. It, it, so I'm just saying it's a little unusual to put a number in against no activity. And so after the number is in, and then we justify the number by discussing the activity. That's my point. Well, that number actually came from a quote from over two years ago. Rachel. So we could go back out. It may only be a thousand dollars. I understand. That. I, think, I think you're missing my point. That's not that. Yeah, but that will take up well, time. Can, are we do some priorities. <laughs> we didn't have a strategy meeting prior to this. So this is where we discuss the priorities. But there was about. there were discussions about yeah. having uh, redoing the uh, survey in this calendar. No, one of so. one of the unknowns at this point is exactly what revenues we're going to have for renewals this month. We we did make a preliminary de decision not to increase our fee structure this year. We did last year, but are trying to hold the line this year to encourage continuing them with renewals and new folks to come in because you know two hundred bucks a building is pretty darn reasonable. Exactly. We just paid our bill today. Yeah. Uh, what is the question on that? When you have the surveys, when they're all completed and they go out to the different condo associations, are you able to track how many people actually open them? And it's, it's a good, uh, we're talking a high percentage. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. And we, we had <laughs> Sheila uh, help us initially, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure that's really going to be necessary this year, but I think we can. I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to work on, on that project again. And we could sit down and, and figure out you know, what kind of questions and, and what kind of assistance we need. But I think we have a lot of pieces in place now, so it should, it should go a little smoother. And with some of our newer condos coming aboard, that may have an interest in participating in, in kind of survey. So we have a few questions. So Great. Look forward to participating. Okay, with this said, is there any 
formal motion needed to, uh, on this at the, the moment? No, no this, this was for discussion. Okay. And if there is any further questions or suggestions, if there's something that we haven't put in there, uh, we didn't put in a line item for a grant uh, because Rex, we don't have a topic that's really ready for it. And we decided it would probably be useful to only use it if we have an event like we did last year. So it would basically, the income would be balanced with the expenses. We try and balance that out. So, okay. so if something was for it, that would be an added thing that's not in the place. Although uh, Jamie did a really good job of looking at the cost of putting on the uh, platinum sponsored workshops and our members meeting workshops, given that renting anything in this town is on sky high. The uh, complimentary usage places are no longer available. And so you know, everything costs more money, AD costs more money. Jamie's so, done a terrific yeah, job so. of being resourceful uh, on the whole front. So, uh, so let's, uh, any more discussion of the, we'll, we'll bring this back and we'll, we'll fine tune it for adoption. And now, one other question I would have would be on the associate member rates. Are there any associate members here to think that we should be increasing the rates? <laughs> just, no, just asking. Yes. No. Decreasing no. them? I mean, no. I, I mean, let me, let me ask you. We're, we're planning to hold them the same. Is that good, bad, or should it? I think they went up a little bit. Not, no, not this proposed, we're not proposing to change okay, it going forward okay. for the next year. <laughs> if somebody was saying that they should, I'm asking if there's a. I think with it being a transition year, we should probably hold steady. Okay, just wanted to get on the record. Thank you. Okay. okay, so let's close up the discussion on the budget. Um, moving on to old business. Do we have any old business that I'm not clear on? Um, city update, Kathy. I mean, we did so much. I mean, I think we talked a lot with um, Barry Price speaking on behalf of some of the things that are being looked at. I think we're right now, I think we're good. Unless you had something else to add. Yeah. And as far as remarks for me, I made a couple comments mm -hmm. to um, uh, Debbie, so I'll pass on saying anything else. <laughs> Moving along, arts and cultural. Uh, Steve, uh, Ken, I've got it. <laughs> Mixed up today. Ken. Really, I have trouble myself. <laughs> uh, uh, about three things, I think, uh, quickly, I'll try to do it. Uh, on Monday night, there was a reception at the Van Wezel for Jim Shirley, who is retiring as head of the Arts and Cultural Alliance of Sarasota County. There were about 200 people there. It was amazing. And they were all movers and shakers in town. It was wonderful. But there's something very interesting happening in the uh, arts community. There is new life coming to town. Some new people with deep roots in the visual arts community. So I think it's going to strengthen the arts community quite a bit, especially with visual arts. Um, you know, I've been doing tours of the Van Wezel with uh, uh, several members of the Van Wezel staff. We've done three of them. I've been, I think they've been very enlightening, particularly about water issues with respect to the building. Um, we are, we do not have a tour scheduled now because uh, the performance, the event activities in the building are ramping up for the season. And so the staff is very busy, but as soon as we have an opening, I'll let everybody know so that we can try and encourage uh, people to attend. Uh, and I understand that as in this week's Sarasota Observer that there is a guest column of mine about the Van Wezel, which focuses largely on the water issue, which is not part of the public debate, unfortunately. There's got to be more discussion about that. And I brought a couple of pictures I'll pass around today that show where the water originally was. It was behind the municipal auditorium. The original shoreline came up to the back of the, the municipal auditorium and the area where the Van Wezel was built was completely underwater. So the building is very close to the, the, the fill, the edge of the fill, and uh, there's a lot of water problems in that building. So I'll, I'll pass these around so people can get a sense of how significant a problem in the future with sea level rise, with the increasing number of storms, bad storms that we have, and the water intrusion that's occurring through the bottom of the building is going to 
have a, a major impact on that building. Salt water. Pardon me? The salt. The, the, the salt water. water. Yes, of course. And, well, it's and, and the sewage. I mean, the back. And the sewage, there is a yeah. sewage lift station between the, the Van Wezel building and the shoreline, which has flooded, by the way, and people don't seem to know that. But if it's overrun by storm surge, it's going to flood. That's it. That's it? Say okay. that. Okay. okay. Uh, Jamie, on associates and events, uh, update what... Um, what do you have for us? I don't really have any updates. We're going to be working on the next um, associate events. Uh, we have a really great storm. I have it in my mind, but I haven't talked to anybody about it for a month. That'll be in. <laughs> but um, we're probably talking March, April. March, <laughs> April is what I'm kind of thinking. Late March, early April. Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought there was some discussion that you know something related to how condos dealing with insurance yes. and you know, all the related factors. You know, there's a lot that goes into that. Maintenance and <coughs> reserves and systems. And but, but the working idea was somewhat of an insurance on right. You know, with, yes. the yes. the, with the related pieces that yeah. Uh, yeah. go to build the insurance. Do that. Yeah. Because I think what is it around town that the insurance rates are averaging 30% or something like that increases? Well, I mean, overall, your rates, but if you look at your wind, Rate, that's the one that's so in some cases 75% increase. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, moving on, uh, Patrick on green space. Uh, nothing new uh, on that. Uh, we had posted things about the EDCM questionnaire that went out. Uh, I don't recall if that was sent through the December 18th or whether it had already. I think anyway, we had yeah. sent that out. I've not seen anything further, uh, but that would be on our list of them as a follow up. Maybe we'll talk to Nick is here tonight. Nick should be here tonight. Okay. Uh, moving along, uh, homeless, uh, Peter. I think the only significant uh, aspect of homelessness is we finally have an interlocal agreement uh, between the city and, and the county to address uh, illicit behavior, trespassing, that kind of thing on county property which can be enforced now by the SPD. Uh, it will work as an agent of the county, uh, not paid by the county, but as an agent of the county. And uh, they have started with a designated list of 30 sites. This started off quite truly about 10 or 12 years ago um, because of a concern around Selby Library, not just for the homeless uh, or other vagrants, but the fact that uh, teenagers and, and, and very young people we're using their skateboards uh, very liberally um, on the South Beach uh, property. And even though there are some prohibitions about that, the city police uh, could only stand across the street and watch. So we are think that has been one of the first actions by the commission. And we very much appreciate the, uh, the effort to uh, bring some water and water to downtown. When did that go into effect, Peter? I think you were talking about that. Was that immediate? Yeah, I believe it was, yes. Okay. We went to the park for you. <clears throat> All right, and that's it, Peter. I'm homeless. That's it. Okay. Uh, moving transportation, Roger. Okay. Um, well, this stuff about our favorite uh, construction angst, <laughs> uh, the Gulf Stream Mountain, which. Uh, I've been told we should be operational by Christmas. Uh, that doesn't mean it's completed, but uh, it will be in the uh, roundabout. Uh, it will be functioning as a roundabout by Christmas, and they hope to complete the other uh, details uh, by January. So uh, this is a. Uh, so this is a I'm sorry. Is the traffic kind of going back to normal? I mean, the, it will go back yeah. to a 40 million about normal uh, at Christmas uh, into the permanent uh, shape. But we're going to have to go turn. round about. What about the divergent diamond now? They the will be gone. Main Street. Oh, good. Right. They will be gone. Okay. Yeah. The, and yeah, that was a unique uh, 
method of dealing with the traffic, but it sure was complex and challenging. Do you know anything more about the Gulf Stream? Uh, you know, what's it called? It's just in an X shape. It goes by Golden Gate Point entrance in a rather yes. peculiar fashion. That will be gone, it will be gone. when this opens at uh, Christmas. Wow. We'll look forward to that. Yes. Um, well, and a couple of comments about that. Uh, the um, uh, the, the MPO Metropolitan Planning Agency uh, had approved the city's request back in uh, 2015, I believe it was, for a series of roundabouts uh, from um, on US 41 from uh, Orange Avenue, visualize Orange over by Selby. Uh, to University Parkway up by the airport uh, for 11 roundabouts. And uh, those are slowly occurring and happening. We now have 10, 14, Fruitville, uh, and uh, University. And I was part of a group uh, back in, I think it was uh, 2012, uh, that did the uh, lobbying for that. Uh, some of you might remember Ron Warner, uh, or David Morris, uh, Ron McCullough, and myself. Uh, we had 124 meetings with various um, influence groups, and uh, the city uh, decided to move it forward, and the MPO has adopted this as part of its immediate and long age plan. And so, um, the next thing we get to look forward to in probably a couple of years will be uh, Main Street and Ringling construction, but it won't be a complex like uh, this one was. This was unique. It had to raise a little uh, for the flooding. It had every utility that goes to the island passed through that area. And so it was one of the most complex uh, construction projects. Uh, let's see, uh, back to my notes, and that was the old stream and uh, roundabout. I'm going to pass around, just because I think it's interesting, uh, a way of dealing with uh, pedestrian traffic uh, on the Bayfront. And uh, it, it just, uh, it's, it, it didn't happen, but it was a proposal, and I thought it was historically interesting. Okay, continuing on um, briefly, the Ringling Bike Trail completed, connecting downtown to the Legacy Trail. I have personally not had a chance to ride it yet, but I intend to shortly. Uh, it's really fascinating and seems to be operating quite well. And uh, of course, we heard plenty about the parking and restaurants. Uh, and that, uh, that's been extended for three months, and there's obviously lots of disagreement about uh, what should and shouldn't happen with that. That concludes my transportation report. And that's just if I can just embroider on that slightly, Roger, there was a discussion <laughs> at the city commission meeting the other night about transportation priorities mm -hmm. and um, the funding of, of the same. So uh, I think from a downtown standpoint, I think our, we would I hope there's a consensus that we continue to lobby for what makes sense on Main Street, that we're putting band-aids on the longer term issue on Main Street. There's some hard decisions to make, but the beautification, keeping the downtown experience, if you will, relevant in this day and age, I think is important as we look at Boulevard, the Art Streetscape and 10th, that we know we're having uh, 3,000 new dwelling units being built in the next five years. That's going to bring a lot of folks and a lot of opportunities, but a lot of uh, some degree challenges mm -hmm. trying to get those people working <coughs> and spending money. So um, I continue to make the case about total <coughs> impact fees and how to pay for these, mm -hmm. and why it's appropriate that uh, some prioritization be provided to um, the downtown area where there's a lot of growth. Um, not 
miss all of it, but there is a requirement for this nexus test that I feel is there. I'm going to use the word ignored. That's too strong, but certainly not paid enough attention to as I feel it should be. And Patrick, well, along that line, the other nexus is after you get the Boulevard of the Art 10th Street streetscapes and look at what you can do long term with Main Street is the Fruitville streetscape. Right. Because that is a true nexus and it is the true economic development boom. No, that was one of the primary considerations of that option two configuration was its economic development, the safety of all the traffic going back and forth, especially downtown pedestrians <coughs> trying to get to the bayfront will be transits across Coconut or Central. And those were everywhere we have roundabouts that make it much safer. So I think that's got to be at least in the next three to five years looking at uh, prioritization for the transportation. So I hope you don't heard. lose that. And then once they get the Gulf Stream running, you'll have new data that can run all that traffic data and show basically improvements and long term it would be beneficial. Anyway. I, I have observed and I feel some concern about pedestrian safety going across roundabouts. For example, that large roundabout that we're now going to be enjoying as we're driving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, for somebody like me who wants to walk down Gulf Street and go to Florida Studio Theater across 41, I've got this big circle of fast moving cars. And I know those hawk light fields that were operational in front of the Ritz seem to be okay, although cars still, drivers of cars still don't seem to know how to use them. What kind of mechanism then? Will they have hawk lights? What, what will be there for pedestrians to get across that about to open large roundabout? Well, the first thing, let me reassure you that roundabouts provide a 50% improvement in pedestrian fatalities and accidents. You're only dealing with traffic coming from one direction, not two directions. You're only crossing two lanes, not five lanes. And so uh, the statistics on it are significantly improving. Not as much an improvement as it is for vehicles, but an improvement a via the haunt lights uh, are to be established on each crossing, uh, as well as, I believe, the one at the Ritz will be there as well. Um, and well, they put that back. Gonna, <laughs> my understanding is they're going to put that back. I'm still a little nervous about that. Um, and so uh, this should be significantly better. One of the, uh, you can negotiate around about only at about 20 to 25 miles an hour. That's a lot better if you get hit than if it's a 30 mile an hour. Uh, that's one of the reasons that it, uh, Are you talking about a car or a human body? <laughs> I'm talking, yeah, I am. Car versus human body, I think. The United States has, uh, its fatality rate on highways is four times higher than- Yeah, I've read that in New York Times. Yeah, and any of the European countries and um, uh, one of them is that we've been a slow adapter on roundabouts. Uh, France has 45,000. Uh, it's the size of Texas. We have 5,000 uh, for the entire United States. So uh, it's something that's been slow and evolving. Uh, we're really good at making streets fast. The trouble is if you get hit on a fast street, it's so the idea of narrow lane, well, take a look at ring lane. Uh, that's uh, a traffic calming, complete street uh, attempt, um, reducing it from four lanes to two lanes. Uh, it's, it's slower, it's safer. That's what you want to say. Well, it's going to be endorsed with all of it. Roger was saying about the roundabouts and having walked over here and crossed at the 10th Street and crossed at the Fruitville several times, I will say if all residents do it, they're safe as long as you wait until all lanes come to a complete stop. Because 
they are breezing through the Foucault roundabout at about 35 miles an hour, not 15, they 20 like they should be, yeah. because, because they can't. It was not round enough. It and needs to slim down and it needs something to slow them down. And when they're coming down southbound on 41, that's a tenth street still. They come down there pretty fast. So anyway, they are safer than just crossing Fruitville on a regular intersection uh, where you're having to look at the cars left turns in front of you, back in back of you, coming around. You know, big trucks, they don't see you. So, I think yes, they're safer overall. So. Yeah, with pedestrians, it's one thing. Bicyclists is another oh, issue. Yeah. It's, it's, no. it's tragic, actually. Um, and when you talk about traffic calming, you know, there's been recent incidents where we hope to have more traffic calming when you are approaching that um, roundabout. And I don't know if the new uh, roundabout is going to have that. Um, well, that's that the intention, I hope. Uh, the expectation of doing it. You want to look at traffic calming and check the bridge. It was built for 70 mile an yes. hour traffic. Correct. And it's pretty successful um, in that regard. Um, traffic going really rapidly over. Uh, they're going to restripe it. Uh, they're going to put in the bus bicycle lane combo, which I've seen work, but it make me nervous. Uh, and then they're going to narrow the lanes, which encourages people to be driving slowly. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on to zoning, and I'm trying to figure a way to get into this. It, it seems to me, first of all, we're looking for more committee help on zoning, and we may have, I'm hopeful that some of our friends from uh, Ritz Quay and uh, Boulevard uh, might consider uh, joining in the zoning group. Uh, my way of thinking, we've got some um, short, medium, and longer term zoning issues. Uh, of late, um, I circulated in the in the board packet the uh, images, drone, and otherwise of the one park uh, project and the um, nature of that project, which I fully until the last few weeks I didn't quite grasp. Okay, the enormity of that uh, building um, and uh, the size, and then of course the, uh, the legal issue and other issues with regard to the air rights. Um, the Ritzway people and I've gotten to know, uh, um, you know, Jeff and, and, and Wayne on the issue. Uh, they've asked for our our support in. You know, trying to get a, a, a resolution to this matter. Um, uh, there'll be some additional developments as soon as Friday. It was at the DRC today. Uh, uh, this may be a little bit unusual, but Wayne, do, do you have a, a couple words to say about where things are, or Jeff? Uh, yeah, I'd Jeff. be happy to. So I, I actually have uh, have spoken twice in my lifetime in front of a city commissioner. It was both on this issue in the last six weeks or so. Um, I'm on the board at, at, at the New Ritz building, so Wayne Wings, our president. Uh, we found out about a year ago about this project at one park and, and realized that the way they are planning to build it, um, they're, they're essentially taking our property or taking our air rights over Quake Commons. So we, we're in a big legal dispute with them. We're going to start seeing some resolution for that starting Friday. We have our first hearing. Um, I, I think it's going to work out favorably for us, but you never know when you're built in front of a judge. Um, in any case, we're going to have years of, of litigation over the air rights of that property. I reached out to David today to ask for this organization's support <clears throat> from a different perspective. It, it, that building, if you've seen a rendering of it, um, is enormous. Mm -hmm. it, it is, if you've seen our building, the new Ritz building over there, it's about three times uh, what, what our building is. It, it, and and I, I wish I had, I didn't expect to speak to you on this day or I would have brought a rendering showing just how massive that is. Yeah. It goes from, <clears throat> from 41, uh, all the way almost over to where the Hyatt building is. 
just one massive building with a small tunnel uh, that, for a road uh, that's 14 feet high. It, it's unbelievable. Um, we, uh, we we would really like this organization to support. Oh, there we go. There's there's a photo. Uh, that photo doesn't do it justice. When you see that building placed on the property itself, you realize what a monstrosity is. Um, we all know where the, the garden club is there on just on the north side. This time of year, when the sun is as far south as it is, the whole garden club is going to be in the dark uh, every afternoon. It's going to be shaded. It, 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 the, the impact of that, oh, there you go. That, that photo right there is, is the one I was referring to. The impact of a building that size on, on a lot of things, not only safety and traffic and so on and so forth, um, it, it's going to be enormous on the city. So I mean, any assistance you can help us. Okay. Um, and and be great. great. Thanks Thank for uh, sorry, it's already going. And uh, so this issue is before us, but this leads us to uh, the zoning text uh, work that will be you know, for the future. There are some other projects that are in a smaller way as they're uh, concerning. There's a, one on Fruitville right at Coconut that I think I put in your packet also that is right zero setback. And we continue as a city to do um, people complain about the view or embassy suites, but we keep doing it. So the question is, in this meaningful resident input, how is there a way to be pro-development, if you will, and pro-sanity and pro-character? And, uh, you know, that's the concerning thing, as Jeff and Wayne have said about that project, the enormity of it and the incongruity of it with the garden club and the entryway to our beautiful new park. I would also add that um, that uh, Boulevard of the Arts to Primary Grid Street, the setback is zero to five feet. So if the Hyatt gets torn down and rebuilt, and you, instead of the 30 foot, now it's at their drop off area or 40 feet or whatever it is, you're going to have a canyon right across the street from the new shade structure at the bay and the concession center. So something's wrong. <laughs> um, so well, the question David, is David, wait a minute. The, the question is does the, the building meet the zoning code? And, and it, yeah. Okay. Then what's wrong? The zoning code. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. The zoning yeah. code. Then you've got a different issue, which is the zoning code, but, not this building. The zoning code that allows, allows for view corridors. And the planning board has to adjudicate whether or not to give up that view corridor. Where's the view corridor? Quay Commons Road. Well, wait a minute. Now, I read in the paper today that the attorney for the One Park Project said that the street is actually an easement, which extends to 14 feet high. Okay. I, if that's know, the I, case, I, yeah. it's a different issue. But that, that seems to be what needs to be adjudicated by the yes, court. That's correct. And, and again, we, we don't have time to get in. But I would hate I mean. to see you and Patrick take a position that the board has not been discussing. We haven't taken. I know, I, I know, but I. I here, the bigger issue is that there is, in order to achieve what they want to achieve, they have to modify the master agreement, or the Quay master agreement. That master agreement was developed over several years, included a multi-use recreational plan. It included, it was preceded by several, several public hearings on vacating the streets and the right, et cetera. Well, if so you there's could a explain lot it well enough that. so that we could understand it, then we could have a discussion. Right. So we're, I think we're trying to say is, as we have done before with our zoning code committee, we've been able to have like group discussions around that. What is the larger issue? Because we try not to say we're going to defend one condo or something, but when there are issues coming up, like master plants, not only at the Quay, but at the Bay Park, those changes, and what is the role of meaningful Public and especially meaningful resident. We're getting off the point here. We're getting away from the point. Well, the point is the, the court case, right? Well, the point is, Kevin, yeah. they, 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 that road is, is, a, is an easement. Okay, it, it's an easement for the public right away and mm -hmm. the city. The 14 feet is something that the developer, he being a developer, the developer was created in 
new side of one. Well, the flame in the air rate's over 14 feet. It doesn't say that. There's no document no, no, that no, says that. What the document that. says is that when the road is completed of construction, when, when the planters are put in, when the lights are put in, the pavers are put in, the plants are put in, benches are put in, it, it's deemed conveyed to the city. So then they went after and decided, well, let's put an epic building. Let's see epic size over the road. That's the size of that third piece, we'll call it. First piece being parcel one of the clay on the corner of 41 floor right here. The last one being parcel nine, which is close towards the high. And they stick another building in the middle, attach it all together to the side of the epic over the road and play in that space. That's what the court case is all about. Exactly. They're looking for declaratory judgment. Exactly. Who owns the air rights? That's what right. we heard on Friday, actually. But the issue that I think you guys are talking about, if I might have time to it for a second, is the setback issue in the city. Are we going to look these buildings inches away from other buildings? They keep ruining the character of the city. Not really. But that's in the zoning this, code. Yes. That's in the zoning code, what you said. The zoning yeah. code needs to be addressed. It's exactly. That's the, exactly. that's the point. That's the point. Exactly. It's exactly. 2020. And since then, you've seen the out. You've seen the one at the, at the uh, 64 Palm Avenue attached physically to the building called the, uh, the Epic. It's attached, the base was attached at the base to our building over at the Quay site. It's do we want that in the city? But the code yeah, that's that's going to apply to this that. project is not what comes in the future, but what exists now. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And that's what I said a few minutes ago. We get a shorter term challenge, but we've got, you know, longer term, what do we want to be as the zoning, new zoning is looked at and what is our input into that process? Mm -hmm. And um, so again, we're running out, did, Mr. McTree, did, did, you, did you have any uh, comments? I, 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 uh, Just something very quickly. Okay, sure. I'm the first representative, I believe, of BLD has become one of these meetings. And I want to share with you the fact that we're shocked. We're shocked at the situation we've been placed in. Understand the fact that we've been asked to be supportive of, uh, of the people that do this. And we are. We're very supportive. And you would think that all of us would be. But we also, to address the issue that you raised, are very fearful of a, of a reality that we just never contemplated. I want you to imagine an adjacent. 80 story, excuse me, 18 story vertical tower only 20 to 30 feet apart from an existing structure. I want you to imagine what it will feel like for me and my wife, who have approximately 800 square feet of, of a balcony, and some of the higher units in the BLD have up to 1,700 square feet of balcony. Only 20 feet to 30 feet away from another unit. I mean, I can smell what they're cooking over there. <laughs> I will see and be subject to sensory deprivation unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. If they turn on the television too loud, I can complain about the person who's downstairs from me, but I can't complain about the person in the next building. As I understand, with all due respect, the master plan allows for that kind of creation. And it's going to be a disaster that the city's going to catch up because my friends at BLBD, they're going to talk about it as they try to move to the list. And that is not good for Sarasota. We came here because we wanted some rest and peace. And here I am, almost 30 years after I retired, standing up before you all. Okay. Well, thank you and for being a, a representative, uh, a representative, just a representative from the OBD. So, David, Chrissy, you've got a hand up over here. Okay. Uh, yeah. I just had a question. Do you all have an engineering report for the sustainability of that impact that you're, I mean, we're, if we retract this back to the Surfside incident, mm -hmm. all the buildings surrounding are now suing because of the impact of that. Uh, you know, construction structure, home integrity um, near their buildings. Do you have an engineering report to help you navigate this? Not yet. Definitely a concern that everybody has a need in, in, in the city of Sarasota. Madam Commissioner, hopefully you're listening. All your constituents in those buildings are now concerned that the construction going on directly on top of their building 
what it's doing to their foundation to look great. Who built these buildings? Like? Uh, the seismic readings that they're both putting in it's all birds are not in the boat, but they put in the ground to, to see what the activity of the soil conditions are. That's first thing. Because you really don't know the impact of these things. These the buildings are not made to be built up on top of each other. And we have this situation where you have a gap between the buildings and now filling the gap with grommets, rubber grommets, trying to deal with this issue. This is part of that, and, and Ken, you can help me with this. In 2020, Duwani put this plan together, right? This is Duwani plan. And, and created this new urbanism, but it looked pretty on pictures. And we were sound asleep in the city house, and people understood it. And here we are now seeing the reality of it. And now we have text that are going on with people over in the city, and they're bringing them up to the public board. And no one now needs to address on this exact issue because you're going to have the city full and still and get scared to by the hour. Uh, and when the rear guard eventually comes down and all that happens, you're going to have buildings on top of buildings on top of buildings on top of buildings. And that'll be your skyline. If that's what we want, then fine, you're not in that direction. If not, we have to do something about it as a city. Okay. And look at all this crap. Yeah, and that has to be, or they could be led by the residents speaking out to their commissioners and then directly <coughs> actually taking action. Well, Wayne, that's why I, I keep harping on the zoning code because we can't do this project by project. Right. We need to do it by the code. It's a text amendment to the code, right? It is extremely galling that no one speaks about what we, as members, of the Quay and the community of 500 feet, what we do for this city. No one talks about the contributions that we make, the kind of contributions that are charitable. Instead, we hear about other folks' contributions as a condition of their doing the work. That is not fair, that is not right, and someone has to speak for us, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Look, folks, well, I'm sorry, we're, we're just, we're backing up. We're going to have our other guests come, so I'm, I've just got to move on. Uh, Bob, is there anything to say about... Just uh, very quickly, uh, uh, I sent you all copies of the Phase 2 uh, project. $65 million in a group. Uh, they're going to include the, uh, the Sunset Boardwalk uh, uh, that's part of Phase 1, which is is going to be completed. Uh, the Boardwalk will be part of Phase 2. Phase 1 is almost uh, totally completed now, I think. The concession stand and the restroom should be open this week or next week is, is the projection. And more details to follow up with Carol. It's, it's, it's very exciting. You saw the conception drawings. It's uh it's, it's really wonderful. But go is, is the Bay Park when they resubmit to the planning board on um, their comp plan amendment change, are they putting in there any edits that they had discussed doing? Not that just limiting the size of buildings before the when they have that when everything's under administrative review. So. Short answer is I don't know, uh, but I would also recommend that I think it'd be useful for the board and, and any of our guests that Bill Waddell or AG Lathrop, uh, as one of our presenters at one of our board meetings uh, in, into next year. Okay. So I would hope that. Yeah, before I, they come in before the planning board, is yeah. alerting people to look at whatever they spent the planning board and whether or not it incorporates the limits. Otherwise, I mean, they were proposing a comp plan amendment that would put all phase two under administrative review with no public input for any development there. And uh, that is what was on paper. And then they waved their hands and said, oh, well, maybe 10,000 max or maybe 20,000 max. So their numbers be put on paper before we see that. Otherwise, it's asking the city commissioners to sell our public hearing rights for a future promise of saving possibly a million or two dollars by doing things quicker. That somehow, just uh, doing away with public hearings. Come on, let's stop opining like that. I'm just it's saying important. there is a issue there on the table that is being kind of lost over. Because you're, you're ignoring the fact that the zoning code exists the community input is not going to change the zoning code. You've got to change the zoning code first. Right. Oh, okay. Well, this, this, okay. So they from the somewhat of a special case to be continued. Okay. Uh, Bob, is that all? Okay. What? Ted, I hope you, you anything you for there. 60 and 8. You were there. Okay. I wasn't there. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, nothing that hasn't been uh, covered. 
Uh, on the Rosemary uh, District Association, the park design continues. We've got a holiday party coming up, and uh, we've got some new restaurants half built at this point. So that's all I've got. Um, Jamie and Kristen on our platform. I want to make it very, very quick because I know that we have a party coming, but um, I was going to call Kristen up here. I'll let Kristen talk about the. Um, Associate members and do that, but I did want to embarrass her for a moment. <laughs> She's not doing this. So. Not coming up there. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if some of you guys know, but Kristen um, will be leaving her role as the associate member liaison. But I kind of did want to discuss everything that she's done for us. She started this program in, I want to say, early 2017. Basically, built the associate membership from scratch and. The associate members and their businesses are what allows us to put on these events that you guys enjoy so much. So first of all, I wanna thank the associate members and everything they bring to the table. But I just wanna say I was, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to work with you and you've done such a great job for us. I just wanna tell you how much we thank you. Pleasure to work with you guys and start from the ground up and see where you've grown since we started. Um, and that's it. I'm excited about where you're going. I'm not going anywhere. As long as my clients uh, want me to represent them, I'll be here and I'm going to help you, Jamie. Anything that you need, so just let me know. So thanks, associate members. Thank you. Thank you. You want like them? Ready? Yep. You're ready. Okay. Yep. So this is probably my last introduction of the associate members, but. All of you Platinum members, if you want to stand up and talk about your companies at this time, I'm not sure who's here. Yeah, we have anybody on. Okay. From there, but. So let's go with Terry. You're here. So let's go ahead. Terry. Hey, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so I work for Sober Tech Consulting. We are a full service engineering firm, water intrusion, milestones, structural integrity. Um, Post collapse, we were on um, Surfside, so we were there for the geotechnical part of it, but we were called off because the insurance company settled. So we do all of that kind of work. So anything you need, um, give us a call. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Happy Terry. To be here. Thanks, Terry. Um, we have D here. We have Lighthouse here. Lighthouse Romance. Just your price in Romance. I'm Rebecca with Lighthouse Role Manage. Thank you guys. I listen to everything. Very interesting. My background's in the legal field, so I'm like very attuned to all this stuff. And thank you for having us. <laughs> Maybe we should have a liaison member that's an attorney slash manager. <laughs> but it's out there. Um, so thank you, Rebecca, for being here. I know you have some buildings that you manage that are here tonight. Um, so you can, uh, Hey everybody, D when they just want to love hire a camera. I haven't seen a lot of you in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Not, one thing about a hurricane, it always brings some rash of bullets right out of the trees, scroll out of the trees, the crack right to So I do like a cat in a litter box while I'm gonna say to cover it up. That's all I have a huge rat job coming up Friday. It's like thousands of rats on my pool. She's so looking forward to it. But anyway, um Happy, almost happy new year to a new year coming on. I've not been out of the picture for a little while. I had a little injury a while back, but I'm still being up in hell and I'm not going anywhere. Looking forward to next year. I'll be more involved. Um, sir, take care of the boulevard myself. I've uh, been taking care of the place, wherever, right place. And I tell you, we take care of so many properties downtown Sarasota, and our job is to make sure that y'all all look good as managers and as board members. But in the meantime, we really take what we do seriously and we really love taking care of our community. That's the reason that we maintain our position as a faculty member in the Dumbbell Social Condo Association. If y'all need anything, y'all don't have to people got me on the speed dial and you need to holler. Thank y'all. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> we missed you, Dee. And just so you know, my position's open. So if you want to come in, and everybody loves you. I'm too busy killing things. <laughs> yeah, you are. And then Patricia, who is this? What is her Well, let's have you come up for her in a second. Um, so, as you know, uh, my clients that I represent that are platinum members of CFIS Insurance, um, hopefully, they're going to have a lot of information for you. Matt is going to the special session on December 13th. Um, they snuck it in last time. They said it was going to be all insurance, and then we had the milestone come in. So you know that's going to happen again. We're going to have maybe some deadlines pushed back because of the hurricane. There might be some changes there. So 
pay attention to that. I hope that uh, I can help you guys out with that um, informational um, educational seminar coming up for insurance. So um, that's Matt Mercier with CBIS. If you need a comprehensive um, evaluation of your property, I know that he just found three downtown that were underinsured before the hurricane. So I know it's hard, I know it's expensive, but you don't wanna be under the gun. You wanna be properly protected. So you need someone that speaks that kind of language. Um, Brightway Emergency Services, they're also a uh, platinum member. Uh, they are very busy down south handling their clients. As you can imagine, Fort Myers, I was just there this week. It's a bit of a nightmare. Um, it's pretty sad. Uh, even insurance agents themselves have lost their property and are getting pennies on the dollar for their reconstruction. So it's very volatile, it's very sad. So um, we have fighters for that. Uh, Rightway is helping out in that area, but they're open for ERPs now. If you don't have an emergency response plan, get one now for next season. I know it sounds early, but some people weren't prepared and they were waiting weeks and weeks and weeks for help. Um, and then I also have Professional Plumbing. They're a platinum member, 24-hour uh, pipelining and plumbing services. Um, and then um, I think that's all my platinum members. I hope I didn't miss someone. One goal. And, oh, oh, as far as my clients, but I think we have some gold members as well. Is Angie and Terry here that wants to speak? I don't know what membership we have. <laughs> I've actually only been with Angie and Terry for a whole week. And uh, Paul Terry asked me to come on the behalf of the firm and help with construction defect cases and also developer turnover. So Christy Chapo, I came out of the industry three years ago before the pandemic. Now I am back in, so I'm representing Angus and Terry. Welcome, welcome back. We, we missed you. Um, I owe you an email, but let's talk. Um, and uh, yeah, we, this group is a great group, so please plug in. And then we also have Sir Pro here tonight. Hey, are you going to shame me tonight, or are we going to go tonight? No, or? no, not yet. Okay. okay. I'm getting everyone now ready for the next step. <laughs> uh, so I'm Brandon, I'm with Pro here in North Sarasota. We are franchised and we operate uh, pretty much everywhere. We have about 2,000 nationwide. But we really kind of hyper focus on North Sarasota, downtown Sarasota, Longboat, Lido. Kind of a nice little nook that we have going on here. Uh, we kind of like to stay here and help you guys out. We're experiencing a lot of hurricane related water issues. So if you guys think you have water and you're like, yeah, it'll drive on its own, uh, yeah, it'll drive on its own. So, uh, might be a little green or a little black. So you got to do those things to get involved where your doors are so. That, that's definitely a thing. You have the mold issue. So some areas were, you were not able to access in a you know poignant time. And so that's where the mold um, starts up. So definitely that's the issue. Is, is hot wire a gold? Yeah, I can't remember. I think you're a gold, Steve. So why don't you come up and talk about yourself? Is that right, guys? Is hot wire a gold? Yes. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Steve Shaw from Hotwire Communications. We are a fiber optic uh, provider of internet and television services exclusively to HOAs and condo associations. Um, and we are uh, making our mark signing buildings uh, very quickly here in the Sarasota area. And we're very excited about that. Uh, I just wanted to take a second and thank Kristen as well. Um, as she departs, um, I want to impress upon you the value that us as associate members have uh, when we are part of organizations like this, when we're allowed to be associate members. Um, it's invaluable. There are not many opportunities we have uh, as vendors to interact with property managers and board members one-on-one, -on -one, get to know you from a personal standpoint. And I, I really do appreciate the opportunity and I thank you for uh, allowing us to be a specific group in your organization. Thanks, Steve. It's a great group. So I'm hoping that I know there's interviews going on. So I'm just let me know if I can help in any way. Um, Dee, did you want to make an announcement for Patricia? Hello, everybody. I'm Patricia Straker. I just sign Dutch. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, Patricia, she heard her back and she asked me if I would speak for her. You know, Patricia said, or she does her phrasing and she takes care of all the high rise stuff. She's an enthusiast on our paper hanger. Unfortunately, she can't be here. And I should say, with mosquito. Neither one on paper hanger, mosquito bite on your butt. Now, I'll try to do that. <laughs> but anyway, 
she asked me to please say, you know, thank you all. And she will be back next year and she's going to continue to be on a sponsor of this. And she thanks you all. And anyway, let's pray for her. She gets well. Thank you. Again, Stabler appraisals, they work hand in hand with Sofatech Engineering um, so that they can work with a professional engineer for their appraisals. So uh, we're happy to have them as well. So thank you, guys. Oh, sorry. I'll be brief for Nikki Cobritz, um, and I own Utah Aging Home Care, which is a private human agency in Sarasota. And we are a concierge limited practice in Benedictine for 30 some odd years. And we provide services in Sarasota and Longboat King. That's all. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, all. Uh, 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 moving along, uh, our next meeting will be on January 5th, same time, same place. Um, I'd just like to wish everybody a really happy holiday season and uh, adjourn the meeting until we can uh, enjoy a little bubbly. So. Thank you all for your support over the years and the year, and uh, let's have a, a, a great review. Thank you. <laughs>